About two years ago, in this exact same event, there was a session of government-linked data. Um, and the speaker um, asked everybody who did something with government-linked data to step forward and give them a brief introduction of their work. Um, I stepped forward and introduced myself as the most unlikely candidate to ever talk at the Semantic Technology Conference. And today I'm giving a keynote, so how wrong was I then? And why unlikely, like uh, Tony said, I'm a professional firefighter. For the last 14 years and the last 10 years, I'm stationed in the city center of Amsterdam. Besides that, I always also run the company NetEdge, my company where I'm the lead architect. And we've been in information management business for the last 16 years and done quite some stuff in the fire department business for the last 10 years. So I'll be giving this presentation with two hats on, or more specifically, a helmet and a hat. Um, and I'll try to, get, to explain you how this, this all came together. When I look from an information perspective at an incident at the fire department, I could draw a picture which could be something like this, a graph with various bits and pieces of information which make up the incident. When I look up the same incident as a firefighter, this is what I see. The lower right corner, that's me before I'm entering this house. So what is bringing these two things together, this information architect and firefighter? It's my fear. And that sounds a bit strange, because firefighters are considered to be heroic, fearless, lifesavers, and here stands one who's afraid. My fear is that something will happen to me or either one of my colleagues during an incident, and after we investigate this incident, we will figure out that everything we needed to know to prevent this accident from happening was already known inside our own organization or that of our partners. So, if somebody reads the report afterwards, he will raise his hand and say, hey, I knew it was dangerous for those guys to run in there. That's a pretty bold statement to make. So I'm going to take you on my journey where I started to realize that things were not really going well as they should. So what do we do as firefighters? We do the really simple incidents. Here we are saving a wounded seagull from the frozen canals in the early January this year where we're basically assisting the um, uh, animal ambulance. This picture I showed before, this is like a standard house fire. And trust me, if it happens to you, it's horrible. It's really the worst thing that can ever happen. I'm very happy that it never happened to me. But this is what we do basically on a daily basis. This is routine work. I'm standing there in the right corner, waiting for my lineman to enter the house, and eventually, we managed to save a father and, a, and his uh, little daughter from the, from the sleeping room in the back. And then we have e um, incidents like this. These are like the, the, the classical canal fires in the city of Amsterdam. Even these make us go, wow, whoa, that's some serious work. And as you can see, if you look closely at the picture, there's quite some material, quite some units standing there. This needs a bit more coordination. This needs a bit more information. And it's a long night work for the guys to do that. So what is the information we, we, want to, we want to access? What is it if we drive to this fire incident in this four minutes time? What is in our mind? A lot of things. We're trying to think about a lot of things. It's a big cloud of all sorts of random thoughts. And there's quite some information available in the back end. To give you a, a simple impression, this is a picture of what we think is available as information systems in our own fire departments. So we're not even sure this thing is complete, but this is probably it. That's our own fire department. If you then look at what's available as open data in the Netherlands, there's hundreds of data sets where some of them are potentially interesting for us and some of them are really interesting for us. And even, I haven't seen it this year yet, even in this linked open data cloud, picture, there is information which is interesting, especially for the city center of Amsterdam. Quite some cultural heritage is stored in the linked open data cloud. So we can see on address level if a building is a monument, which means that it doesn't follow any regulations it should if it was constructed now. And this is the high-tech user interface station. We have to access all this information. This is the desk of my chief. This is the front seat of a fire truck in Amsterdam. And you can see all sorts of devices and information sources, and I highlighted them. They all look different. 
Um, they all access their own data silo, and as you can see on the top right corner, there are even books. We have a meter of books in the fire truck, which contains all the information we might need. And then, This is the environment we work in with all this information. And trust me, the sound guys wanted, didn't want to put it up to 120 decibels, which it in real time is. But it's really hard to be concentrated. It's really hard to communicate with the dispatch, communicate with your colleagues, and go over all these bumpy roads through the city of Amsterdam. This is the environment we work in. And there was another problem we, we, we discovered while, while going over the information issue. We have a lot of these interfaces which basically don't answer questions we ask. So we get answers to things we didn't ask. And that sounds a bit strange, but I'm going to give you a few examples of what I mean with that. We have a navigation system in a fire truck. And essentially, a lot of people think, hey, that's a good idea, navigation system for a fire truck. But as a firefighter, I just want to know where I need to go. I want to know where the incident is. And the only thing this tells me is in the upper right corner, in the upper left corner, you see, turn left after 30 meters. So if I come there after 30 meters and I can't turn left, this system just leaves me there. Maybe there's busy traffic, there's a truck unloading. And as a, as a civilian, you would just sit there and wait till the road is free. But for us, the excuse, sorry, traffic was busy, is not really useful. So it leaves us with the choice to Go right, go straight, turn back, and then the navigation system will probably tell us, turn around, when possible, turn around. So we, we, we just have to see how we end up in the right place anyway. So we have to guess. In my uh, service area, in the city center of Amsterdam, we have the Anne Frank Museum, just relatively close by. It's a special building, special history, and a lot of tourists go there. Probably if you ever visited Amsterdam, there's a fair chance that you went there as well. So, for these buildings, for these types of buildings, we have execution plans. Um, this is one out of five pages we have. And there is a lot of information on there. A lot of information I don't even care about as first responder when I go there as the first fire truck. But there is one thing that's interesting for me. Because as sobering as it might sound, I'm, I'm mainly concerned of getting home safe the next morning after my shift and my colleagues to get home safe and bystanders to be safe. And if in the whole process, we managed to save a life that's an extra benefit. So what I'm mostly interested in is in the upper right corner, it's all in Dutch, so I didn't bother to, to explode it too much, is the primary hazards. And now comes the interesting part, because there is a little sentence in there which says, Sehr complex gebouw, very complex building. And then my chief suddenly thinks, okay, we have a procedure for complex building. So he has to make the link to the procedure card. And there are quite some procedure cards you see on the right, whereas, again, primary hazards are listed, which reference to other procedure cards. So he has to follow that link again. And actually getting the plan for the Anne Frank house was following a link from an incident message we got. So he's constantly following links. And if we are thinking about following links and combining information, you start to see all sorts of things. In a lot of cities, you see signs like these nowadays, how many places there are free in a park house. If we go to a park house because there's a car on fire, I'm not so much interested in how many places there are free, I'm interested in how many cars there are in the park house. There are permits for park houses, so somewhere digitally we recorded how many places a park house has. So then we have to look it up in the plan, say, okay, 350 places, this park house is empty, only eight cars and one of them is on fire. If the plan says 3,000 cars, then it's packed, then we have a problem. So why is it? that it's my chief who has to make all the links and the calculations where the data is available digitally. Why is it that we can't create a system where we combine these pieces of information and we simply tell the chief, you go to a park house and we have eight cars in there? And then obviously you have to debate if the, the, t the, the information you get from the park house is always correct, but it at least gives you an indication. So apart from the, 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 the plans and the pieces of information we get, are not really what we're asking for. We always have to deal with something we call reality. We have to deal with incidents like this. This is the biggest chemical fire to date in the history of the Netherlands. 
people from the Netherlands who are already, they definitely know this picture. It was the 4th of January, 2011. And there was a movie made afterwards by the fire department to solve this incident. And the first arriving officer on the scene basically explained, by the time I got there, got out of my truck, assessed the situation, I realized that all the plans, all the procedures, and all the scenarios we have ever trained, because the company was known for its hazardous position, could go directly in the trash can. Why is that? In the middle, you see, oh, there he is. You see this yellow container. It's completely filled with acetone. For the non-chemical people in here, that's highly explosive. So if you see, as a firefighter, a container filled with acetone in a situation like that, we get really nervous because that's not what you want. The problem is if you want to prevent this explosion, you have to cool it with water. But you don't fight chemical fires with water. You fight chemical fires with foam, but that cools really bad. So they were faced with a dilemma. Nobody ever thought that before and they simply had to solve it. So in the end they chose to put out the fire with water and um, as a side effect, it became huge, but the container didn't explode. So now that we have the, the, the situation that we found out that plants don't work, should we make them more extreme? Should we make more extreme scenarios? So, as you can imagine, we sent this guy home who came up with this scenario. He needed a long vacation. <laughs> or didn't he? So what you, what you see here, up there, is a family car, a Skoda Octavia, in a church roof. <laughs> if you go to your average firefighter training center and you say, you go, we're going to put this car up there, and you're going to get this guy out, you're going to train that the car crashed in the roof, and you're going to get this guy out, they're going to send you away with your arms on your back. You, you need a long holiday, unless you show them this picture. The guy was stuck there for two hours in this car and the fire department had to go through all their creativity to get him out to stabilize the car at this great height and to even work safely at this height because that's not something they do, the jaws of life at about 30 foot in the air. Okay, the question which hangs in the room obviously is how did he end up there? <laughs> um, this, is, this has happened in Germany and in Germany you don't have speed limits on the highway. He took a ramp, didn't make the turn and launched himself 35 meters through the air was stuck there for two hours. So thinking about highly improbable things, I was reminded by a book I have been reading, The Impact of the Highly Improbable by Nassim Taleb. It goes about financial crisis mainly. But he says, he uses the metaphor of black swans because black swans didn't exist in Europe. So swans were considered to be white. And that was so, people were so sure of that, that even in the language, in Old English, you have an expression that happens sooner than you find the black swan. Until they started sailing the world in Australia and New Zealand, they found black swans. He uses this metaphor to explain highly improbable and unpredictable events. Um, and he, he explains um, the invention of the wheel, World War II, 9-11, and, and for example, Fukushima, which happened recently. And if you think about Fukushima, there was really a, a chain of unlikely events. And afterwards, suddenly in Europe, all the uh, uh, atomic power plants were controlled for earthquakes, tsunamis, power outages, all in one. And first, we never bothered about that. And that made me realize, from all the incidents I've seen in the 14 years, they're small black swans. So my fear is essentially about that we're not able to deal with these small black swan events because the information we use and the information we get is completely out of context. It doesn't really make sense to go to an event and use plans which were created three years ago and assume that everything is still the same. So what should we change? We should change the mindset for this. We should change the way how we deal with information in these kind of operational situations. We won't kill the black swan. It will always be there, and we have to learn to embrace it, to sort of start loving the, the poor animal. And there is no overnight solution. We try to think, at least as firefighters, we think, oh, we put in a new procedure, and then our problem is gone. Are we going to put in new plans or a new piece of software or another gadget in the fire truck? It doesn't work that way. And we have to use something we are pretty good at. We're pretty agile as firefighters. 
you see, they solved the incident in the end. How unlikely the both incidents were, they did solve it. It's not burning anymore, and the guy is, came out of his car. So why not use the same idea in the way we develop systems to support us in this? <coughs> um, what we should try to do is try to gather information based on the context where we're actually trying to, to solve the incident. And we have to face the, the information. So what the ideal world would look is that you, while driving to this incident, you generate a graph of information about the incident, about what we know, and in time. I didn't draw any user interface in this part, specifically, because it's not about the gadgets. It's about having all this information available and making it linked together so that the chief doesn't have to go through all the books. Like I said, be agile. So you have to start small. So I'll take you, oh, I'll take you back one step. What's the original situation we had to get the information to the fire truck? So when somebody calls 911 in the Netherlands, they fill out a, a, in a computer screen and they generate a message and then the system will figure out which fire station or what fire truck needs to go there. This creates a dispatch message, which is then sent to the fire truck. And this is our single entry point of information. It's highly cryptical. You can, you can see, you can extract Anne Frank House from this. After a few years, you understand these messages, but that's the, this is the only part of the information we got in the fire truck. And then it was up to the chief to take this information and link it all together. Find procedure numbers, find addresses, et cetera, et cetera. So what we decided to do is to take this dispatch message and convert it to RDF. And for the same reason Steve explained, because we had no idea what kind of information later on would become needed in the system. And we wanted to do linking. And RDF is all about linked data, so that was the obvious choice to do that. So the first incarnation that basically takes the RDF, the cryptic message, and uses something we called Firebrary, a SCOS vocabulary which ex expands all the small identifiers to readable strings, um, add some information about location to the incident, and we extract plans and procedures, which we have as RDF, and we add them to the screen as well. So this Fireberry is supposed to be an authoritative set for fire department terms. It's not fully operational for the public yet, but for the fire department, we use it, and we're starting to implement more and more of our implicit terminology to make it really explicit terminology. For the plans and procedures, you can see they're all little squares um, and all these squares have a relation to each other. So it was relatively easy to at least extract RDF literals out of them as a start. It's probably not how you would completely do it as a semantic beautiful solution, but it, at least it worked for us. And then it ended up looking like this. This is a screen we have currently at the fire station. You can see on the, on the left side, you see a map, a zoom in of the city of Amsterdam. This is my fire station. This is the Anne Frank house, and you can see it's a straight road. It's 600 meters, 53 seconds on average. Um, and you can see that in this way, the driver is able to, if this big road is blocked, he still is able to take plan A, B, and C out of this one, instead of go straight, and if that doesn't work, he's lost. On the bottom, you see that the whole message is basically extracted, and, and, and the strings are decomposed, or the, the codes are decomposed into full strings. And on the right side, if there is a, if there is an execution plan for this um, uh, building, you will find a list of primary hazards. So in this relative tranquility we have at the fire station, as the alarm rings and we put on our gear, we can look at this screen. So before we go out in this truck with 120 decibels, we go look at the screen, and then we take all the information with us. This is the situation as it now is in the fire station. On the top screen, it's an LED scrolling display. And with these big, big messages for the, 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 the incidents where we have all these plans and procedures and a lot of fire trucks go there, when you try to put on your boots, you have to be sure that you look at the right time to find your piece of information, either an address or a procedure plan, etc. With the screen underneath, everything is there uh, how we want it. So what are the st statistics of this? Currently, 20 fire stations in the city's, city of Amsterdam, the large area of Amsterdam, use linked data, real-time linked data, on a day-to-day -day basis. None of the firefighters who ever looks at the screen has any clue about semantic web technology or linked data. 
but they just love the tool because it gives them an answer to the question they had. We have about 30,000 calls a year. Um, we store about 120,000 resources, so it's relatively small, uh, small solution. And we uh, started using Kasabi to make this public data. Anonymized it, but we made it public. <coughs> and now I recognize that I forgot to enable the internet connection. Up. Quickly do that. So what you see here is a map of the city of Amsterdam when it draws completely. And the red flags are things that happened in the last 24 hours. So this is something which is happening today in Amsterdam. This is real-time linked open data. If you're ever in Amsterdam and you're in front of a fire station and you see a fire truck drive out, you can find the address and the type of incident it runs to directly in the linked open data cloud. Lost my mouse. So, what are we doing right now? It's a small field test. Beginning of this year, there was a really interesting data set opened up the Building and Address Administration. It's a free translation, more or less. It contains all the relationships between dwellings, buildings, and the streets they were in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And for us, that was really interesting because then you could get an authoritative set of information about um, the, the buildings we have to go to. And we started to create a little tablet application. What you see here is a zoomed in level of the uh, Anne Frank house. And on the right side, you see a red outline. This outline comes directly from open data. There's nobody in the fire department who is responsible for maintaining this information. We simply import the data, and I've created a RDF front end for it, and we can implement it directly. Another thing which is really interesting for us is usage functions of the building. Every dwelling has a usage function. And for the Anne Frank house, it's a resemblance function. It's a museum. But this system can tell us that in the same building as the Anne Frank house, we find dwellings which have living function, which might sound a bit strange, but Amsterdam has a lot of complex buildings. So if you go in the middle of the night to the Anne Frank Museum and there is an incident there, then it's like, okay, not too many people around, the museum is closed, and then it's okay, but we figure out that people could live there, so that could change the way we operate. The same goes for the bottom part where every building has multiple entry points. At least that's possible. So you find out that there is also an entry point at the Westermarkt in this street, where the main address is on this street. <coughs> We're trying to, to incorporate this more and more, because the interesting thing for us in this is that we have quite some of this information for buildings which need plannings, which need permits. But the larger part of the addresses we go to don't need permits, just simple living areas. So we can use this really well to see a, go, a, a quick picture of how a building should look. So what's happening right now is that um, the work in Amsterdam di didn't stay unnoticed. Um, the, the National Fire Department organization in the Netherlands decided that the, this library we created is really useful to create a standardized terminology at, at a certain point. So we're currently working with that to, to see if we can make this a big, big project. Besides that, um, in the European Union, there is now a big project going on to uh, talk about e emergency co communication in disasters, so cross-border events. And for the people who follow the SCOS tutorial or some of the SCOS sessions, you see that SCOS is really brilliant to do multilingual um, um, labels for, for, for incident types. So we're going to use the Firebrary as well to go across the border so that we can explain to our colleagues across the border what we are actually doing because we speak different languages across the border in Europe most of the time. And for the world level, um, I decided to join this government linked data working group. There's a session about that this week as well. Because if you want to promote that people start using linked data, which is better for me, for my safety, it's really important that you have some sort of standard. And there's a standardized body who's supporting that. And that's the W3C government linked data uh, group doing that. So I didn't go too much into technical details. Uh, one of the things we, we did, we used simple ontologies to, to describe the messages. It's the same like Steve said, don't over-engineer it completely. 
it works for us and that was the most important thing. So how's my fear now? Do we have access to all the information? No, by far not. But we see now that there is a slow movement in thinking about how we should interact with information to change that, to change this mindset. The firefighters in the field are more and more involved in thinking about what we're going to do in the future. Because most of them have smartphones and tablets nowadays, so they have the impression that they can look up more information on their smartphone than in the systems in the fire truck. So people get smarter as well. As a result of this, um, we get new fire trucks in about two years, and now there's a group of firefighters who is invited to think about, okay, how can we interact with the information we have? Another thing, a movement you see is that now the local um, communities inside the city, local governments inside the city start to promote open data they have to us. So actually people are bringing in information, like could you use that, instead of that we had to go through all the political hardship to get this information out. Um, and what are our goals? <clears throat> then I put on my NetEdge head again. We want to make this a product. Right now, what we use in Amsterdam is a set of stuff, that set of scripts that work, and we're slowly moving and creating a product. We have some fire departments who are interested in using this stuff, and we're actually in the middle of making this a, a real deal. NetEdge would like to be part of this movement in changing mindset, be an authority in... In, in helping fire departments, especially in the Netherlands and Europe, to make this switch, to, to make this switch to think about more the information they need in context-wise than make plans, stow them away for three years and hope that it's useful by the time you get there. So if you think this is an interesting story and you would like to hear me in other places, this is how you can contact me. Um, I'll be around on the, uh, on, the, on the conference for another three days. So please approach me if you have any questions on, on the technical level, what we did. How many people, while listening to my story about improbable events and sort of fear, thought about events in their own organization where they thought this is right, highly improbable that it happened, but if I was able to link more information in my own organization better and smarter, I could have coped better with it? Because we truly believe that although we use it for the fire department right now, this is something that you could use in more places as well. There are more improbable events happening in the world than just strange fires and strange uh, car accidents. Thank you. But great presentation and great job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would it, does anybody have a question they'd like to post about right now? If not, uh, again, you can join him after during the break. Uh, looks like Mills back there. You can probably shout yours out, Mills. I liked the, um, uh, the lightning talk yesterday about uh, linking or, or non-profit organizations should doing linked data. Uh, <laughs> I see the thumbs up back there. Uh, I was really pleased with that. Um, um, the thing is that, like I said, none of my, my colleagues actually knows it's linked data, so we should, should try to be less taggy and more making it useful. That's, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the idea, I say.